and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 204, The Japanese Empire Doubles Down in Shanghai. Last time, on August 28, 1937, the Chinese defenders had just lost the town of Lo Dien, which represented the most inland position held by the invading Japanese in the Shanghai area. Clearly, it had to be retaken, and quickly, before the enemy could consolidate their holding. This is what Gu Lugui, the chief of staff of the Chinese Army's 14th Infantry Division of the 15th Army Group, urged. However, Chinese culture got in the way of what should have been the next obvious move. As Gu Lugui knew no one on the staff personally, the 15th Army Group had just been recently formed, his idea was not taken up enthusiastically by anyone else. Oh yes, they agreed in general and would carry out the plan, but as its source was an outsider... It was seen as promoting the career of an unknown, which flew in the face of helping those that one knew well, who were also looking out for you. Gu's superiors ordered the attack, but those below Gu would only half-heartedly carry out their instructions. Furthermore, as the 14th Infantry Division was currently guarding the banks of the Yangtze River, but then received orders to move out, only two of its four regiments got underway, the 79th and 83rd. Gu Lugui went out with the two regiments who were to attack the Japanese at Lo Dien on the night of August 29th. As the area had just been taken by the invaders, Gu made another suggestion that surely their defenses had not yet been established, and hence the attack should be launched forthwith. The divisional commander agreed, but again, this idea had come from an outsider, so the lower orders were not enthusiastic. It must be remembered that all armies are made up of people that bring their cultural bias to the front. It was decided that the 83rd Regiment would charge right at the western side of Lo Dien, but this was not to be a suicidal attack, as may be believed. While the 83rd made a show of approaching the western bridge, The 79th would swing around and enter the village from the east, thus coming upon the distracted Japanese units. This had also been Gu Lugui's idea, and again, his commander had agreed. But those whose rank was just under Gu hemmed and hawed, delaying each action, probably hoping the plan would not be implemented at all. Still, the divisional commander gave the necessary orders. The 79th moved out first, as they would need more time to get into place. When the disgruntled 83rd then moved out and reached the bridge, they tried to cross several times, but the Japanese had set up heavy and light machine guns on their end, so each charge failed and ended up with more Chinese bodies being left on the crossway. They had not brought their own artillery to counter the machine guns. Meanwhile, the 79th approached the eastern side of the town, but again, as its officers were not truly supportive of this effort, only one of its three battalions were ordered across a small river. When this battalion crossed over and sent a few men on up ahead to investigate, they reported being able to hear the shooting as the 83rd was attacking to the west. Now would have been the perfect time for the 79th to attack in full force, and yet the other two battalions were ordered not to cross, which was fine with them, and the remaining battalion was told to hide in a bamboo grove on their side of the river. As for the Battle of Lodien, it was about to be decided not by the soldiers fighting, but by their commander. The 79th and 83rd's divisional headquarters was stationed just west of Lodien, as the commander needed to communicate with his regiments. But when 15th Army Group Commander Chen Chang showed up, he immediately ordered the command post to pull back, saying, This command post is way too far in front. The Japanese planes are no joke. By dawn they'll see you and smash you to pieces. But if the 14th Divisional Headquarters pulled out, at the very least, this meant the Battle of Lu Dien 
was over. Furthermore, the men fighting had to be contacted and told to disengage. Right away, the divisional commander made contact with the 83rd to the west of Ludien, and they were told to pull back. But the 79th could not be reached. If nothing else was done to make contact, then those men of the 79th would eventually be discovered by the enemy and slaughtered, as they would have no support. The men around the commander begged him not to sacrifice those men, no matter the order from Chen. The commander, much to his credit, agreed, and had a jeep drive him to the 83rd's position, while his staff began packing up. Their goal was to evacuate the area before the sun rose, which would bring enemy scout planes. When the commander reached the 83rd, he asked for a situation report. The news could have been better and more accurate. The 83rd could not only not cross the bridge, but had lost 200 men in their attempts. Then it was reported, ignoring all reality, that the 79th had crossed the river to the east, but that then two of the battalions had pulled back. The third was still missing, somewhere in eastern Lodien. When the sun rose, the division's headquarters was heading west, towards safety. The 83rd was also moving west, away from the Japanese. The two battalions of the 79th were also on the move, but not those in the bamboo grove. Having spent the night hunkered down, the men were still discovered by the Japanese around noon the next day. Soon bombs were raining down on them, and Japanese machine guns had been trained on their position. The men ran for the river, those that were still alive. Some drowned as they tried to cross, others were shot as their heads were now slow-moving targets above the water. By the time the unlucky battalion was also heading west toward safety, it had lost more than half of its strength. Ironically, as the overall battle raged ever larger just north of the city center, the place where the fighting had started, the older district had grown quiet. When the Japanese divisions had landed, more and more Chinese troops were sent from the harbor area to engage the enemy there. The downside of this was that there was no longer enough troops to go on the offensive against the Japanese marines, still near the docks. By the time the Chinese lost Lodien, the only defenders near the harbor was the 88th Division, half of the 36th Infantry Division, and a brigade. However, as the Japanese landed more men, it was determined by them to finally capture and secure the oldest part of Shanghai. The Japanese attacks grew in strength over the next few days, but what did not change was how the Chinese sought to deflect those attacks. The Chinese would never match the quality of the enemy's weapons, but they still had more men, and those men would willingly sacrifice themselves to keep their nation from invasion. That part of the defensive line, where the men of the 36th Infantry Division were stationed, soon discovered a column of enemy tanks approaching them. The staff officer of the 36th, Jiang Jimin, couldn't help himself and said out loud that they were all in trouble. But even before he could finish this curse, one of the men next to him grabbed up several grenades and ran for the closest tank. Jiang put his head down as the tank drew closer. Seconds later, there was a loud explosion. Jiang slowly raised his head. His comrade was gone, but the tank was no longer moving and had smoke coming out from under it. The staff officer could only guess that the man had positioned himself as best he could under the front of the tank and pulled the pins. Now the other tanks stopped. Then they all turned around and headed back for the Japanese lines. The immediate threat was over. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds, Echoes of History, 
Assassins vs. Templars, is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. Even closer to the coast, just east of the Pudong River, just south of Old Shanghai, the men of the 8th Army Group had yet to see action. It wasn't a matter of cowardice, it's just that the invaders had not yet come to this particular part of the city. The main reason was probably that just across the river, on its western bank, was the various foreign settlements. The last thing Tokyo needed was to anger several other nations, all at the same time. But as Zhang Fakui and his men of the 8th Army Group had not been challenged, Zhang had taken the time to scout the area just east of the river to find the best places to set up his artillery in hiding to harass the enemy. With the war a week old and the Japanese having some success in the north, Zhang had decided the time had come to go on the offensive in a defensive kind of way. As his chosen spots were still viable, the enemy still had not approached the river in this area, Zhang had his smaller mountain guns taken apart and carried by small groups of men to be reassembled once they were in position. As for his larger guns, to move them, even by horse, was impossible, as this area had no decent roads of any kind. By August 20th, Zhang Fakui had his guns in place, but he knew that once he started firing, his locations would be discovered, and then their fire would be met with that of the enemy's warships and bombers. So Zhang had his artillery pick their targets, and commence firing just as the sun was setting. They would fire off shells for ten minutes and then quickly take apart the guns and move to a new location in the now dark. Just minutes after that, sure enough, their former locations would be turned into hell on earth from the Japanese firepower. Jung had his guns focus on the enemy marine headquarters and the Japanese consulate, no reason to give those civilians any peace. He would also attempt to confuse the enemy by having some of his infantry load up in boats and dash across the river, yelling, Charge! purposefully loud enough for the enemy to hear. Meanwhile, his guns would go about their business, striking what targets they could as the Japanese prepared for the approaching assault. But at the last moment, the boats would turn around and make for safety the guns using the additional time gained by the confusion to their advantage. But what Zhang Fakui wanted to destroy most of all was the venerable cruiser Izumo. Surely her luck had to run out sometime. However, the captain of that vessel borrowed from Fakui and moved his ship each day, sometimes in response to where it was needed, at other times just to be prudent. Yet the Uzumo's luck would hold, and Fakwe would never sink the hated enemy battleship. As for those foreigners within the settlements, they continued to watch the unfolding and ever-enlarging battle. They knew they were safe, relatively so. Still, errant shells would at times land amongst them while they tried to get on with their daily lives. Hundreds would die in time as shells landed amongst them. When tragedy struck, members of the Red Swastika Society would come in and help those still alive. Founded in 1922, the Red Swastika 
not unlike the International Red Cross, established in 1863, ran poorhouses, soup kitchens, and hospitals. The swastika, meaning infinity in Chinese and other cultures, was a symbol of the manifestation of God, or its creation. After the wounded were helped and the dead taken away, the red swastika members would hose down and clear out the streets as best they could. The bombs that came down on the foreigners were probably mistakes. However, the bombs that came down on the Chinese civilians were not. Each time this happened, the Chinese diplomats would complain to their Japanese counterparts. But they, being told what to say by the military, explained away these events as accidents. Yet, by the third week of the Battle of Shanghai, targeting Chinese civilians had become routine. As stated previously, Soviet Russia signed a non-aggression pact with Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government. But it was officially announced on August 29th, as the battle over Shanghai raged. One must remember that before the non-aggression pact between Stalin and Hitler, these agreements were taken much more seriously. Not only would this treaty bring in Soviet military assistance, but it would also guarantee that Moscow would not conclude any kind of agreement with Japan while this current conflict continued. Chiang Kai-shek had been aiming for this since late 1936, and now that it was a reality, he ignored the British diplomats when they told him that Stalin was only out for himself, that Stalin wanted a war between China and Japan, so offered aid, knowing that Chiang would deal more forcibly with the Japanese, which would give Stalin more freedom to focus on Hitler-dominated Europe. But this mattered not to Chang. He knew war, in some form, was coming with the Japanese. Hence, he pursued the political and military alignment. Besides, the second part of his plan was to hold out. He knew he couldn't win outright until the U.S. or the USSR got involved. Neither of them wanted a strong, dominant Japanese empire. It would be argued later that Chang purposefully chose Shanghai to defy the Japanese, as a war here would affect the economies of several Western powers, and hopefully bring them into the war sooner. Near the end of August, the Japanese found themselves not barreling forward, as they had expected, through the less experienced, inadequately trained, and armed Chinese. At the moment, the invaders held the areas to the north of Shanghai Center, as well as the garrison in the older part of the city center. Currently, General Matsue Iwane, the expeditionary forces commander, had only 8,000 men on shore. This was clearly not enough to move forward on a general front, much less push back the defenders, even with Lo Dian having recently been taken. General Matsui contacted Tokyo and asked for more men, or rather, asked to have his entire force more than doubled by requesting five more divisions. With these, he explained, he could quickly get the job done and teach the Chinese a much-needed lesson. The Japanese imperial staff and navy fell over themselves to grant the general whatever he felt he needed. The men in Tokyo knew they had a fighter leading their men. Those reinforcements would soon be en route, but their journey would take time. The question for Matsui was what to do for now with what he had. As Lu Dian seemed it would hold, the next priority, certainly as more troops were coming, was to neutralize the Chinese artillery stationed at Wusan Fort. The Japanese troops closest to this holdout was the 3rd Lucky Division and the naval ships that supported it. Yet the Chinese artillery there at the fort continued to strike at anything that moved and at the enemy's ships. Those ships' guns would return fire and damage the fort's ancient walls, but they could not take out the guns. Whenever supplies were unloaded nearby, the Chinese guns would erupt. Men and supplies were lost on a regular basis. 
The Japanese ships, at times, were forced back to the middle of the Huangpu River. It was soon not worth even trying to unload here, yet the men had to have food. Moreover, more men were needed here, if there was ever going to be an assault on the Wusong Fort. Eventually, the Lucky Third came up with a plan to take the fort, but found themselves without enough men to bring it off, as unloading reinforcements was impossible. It was indeed a catch-22. That's when the frustrated Matsui took over. He chose to have the 3rd Division launch a frontal attack of the fort, but would also have a detachment from the 11th Division, it would be the size of a regiment, come from the northwest relative to the fort and attack it from the rear. It was wondered if the 11th Division itself should go it alone, but the more experienced officers decided that the 3rd had to play a part, if only to salvage its morale. It was also decided that, while on the way to Wusong, the men of the 11th would take the fort of Shizi Ling along the coast before heading on. In the early morning of August 31st, the Japanese opened up with an intense naval and aerial bombardment of Wusong. Then at 10 a.m., one regiment of the 3rd Lucky Division loaded up on landing craft, sailed down the Huangpu River, and offloaded just north of the village, with the fort inside. As the day went by, the Japanese regiment fought against various Chinese troops just outside the city, trying to stop their entry. That same morning, the 11th Division's Asama Detachment moved out from Shan Shoku and headed southeast along the coast for five miles, or eight kilometers, towards Shi Ziling. This fortress was not the equal of Wusong and would fall the next day, on September 1st, in the afternoon. As for the lucky third, progress was made, but it was slow and costly. Their attack was helped by the guns of nearby warships. Finally, on the morning of September 2nd, the two forces pushed in on Wusong. The Chinese there held out as best they could, many fighting to the death, but the previous day's artillery had been more accurate than known, as many inside were already dead or severely wounded. Well before noon, the Japanese took control of the village of Wusong and its fortress. Now, the unloading of men and material in this area would speed up appreciatively. By the next morning of September 3rd, the Japanese controlled the coastline from Chan Shoku to Wusong, that is, to the north of Shanghai, to its northern edge, except for the village and fort of Baoshan, in between Shizeling and Wusong. That had been bypassed by the 11th to ensure the timely attack on Wusong. Chiang Kai-shek and his generals knew that the fight over Baoshan would be next. Thus, the nationalist leader told the 28-year-old Lieutenant Colonel Yao Xingping, commanding the 98th Infantry Division's battalion there, to hold out at all costs. Thus, the next stage was set for the next battle. The Japanese would attempt to secure this last holdout along their part of the coast, to then push west, while the defenders would attempt to deny the invaders what they sought and needed. Chiang Kai-shek's most important assets, his men and their bravery, were about to be tested again. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Uh, just to give you a situation report, the time is coming soon where I'll be doing this thing full-time. So here's the part where I sound like a slightly past his prime gigolo. If you've ever thought about supporting the show, now would be a good time. There's the World War II podcast membership. For $5 a month, you get two additional episodes where I cover the behind-the-scenes story. Currently, we're covering the Spanish Civil War. If you've ever wanted to buy a Churchill or FDR coffee mug, now's a good time. Just go to the website worldwar2podcast.net. 
but for those of you outside of the U.S., it would be best just to send me an email and let me know where you live. I'll send you a quote. That email address is wwiipodcast at gmail.com. Or, if you're so inclined, there's a straight-up donation. Just go to PayPal and again use that same email address. There are enough of you out there that if some percentage of you could just send a few bucks my way every once in a while, that would go a long way to helping me. So what do you get out of this? When I take this leap of faith, I'll be putting out at least four episodes a month. And as you know, that's a big deal for me. I hope to do more, but four will be my minimum. So please think about helping out in any way you can. And as always, I appreciate you listening. Take care, everyone.